you for all the money that you gave us for our future. We had so much fun. We went on rides and we built uh, building rockets. But my favorite part is when I went on the roller coaster. It was called the G-Force. It goes very, very, very fast. Another ride is called the Spin Tron. It spins you around in different directions. This is the
And before we start with the announcements, I want to say, first of all, a neck that we got to hug that we haven't been able to hug in many, many weeks is Jerry Sid. It's so wonderful to see you. We have thought about you and prayed for you, friend, and we're so glad to see you here. And you have really just fought it, fought it, fought it. And here you are on the other side. We're so glad to have you. Now, a friend we don't have here this morning is our brother Ron Johnson, and he did give us permission to share this with the church. Ron was mugged last night in Frankfurt, walking to the Capitol, right in front of the Capitol, to see the Christmas lights. Broke some ribs, um, and he said, uh, we texted him this morning, Seth was aware of it, and they're good friends, and Seth came and told us, and we immediately reached out, and he said, you know, um, I'm just um, sore and emotional, but I'll be there tomorrow night because I need to be around my family. Amen. And I said, you get here tomorrow, and we're going to surround you with all the love and care that we have. And he also said, tell folks not to walk alone to watch Christmas lights. <laughs> so we can only imagine how he feels so vulnerable, and so we are ready to love him. And I don't know. I'm so grateful, as I know all of you are. It's truly, I talked to someone this week, and I said, what's your church like? I said, it's like family. It's just like family. So we're thankful we can lift each other in prayer. Hey, we have some announcements. We have some announcements. Everybody try to be here January 13th. We have a congregational meeting right after worship. And Rita, will you stand? Rita will be in the fellowship hall right after uh, the church. She's got lots of things you can put in people's stockings, some fair trade. It, it's a, a good thing for us to invest our money in. And if you don't have money like I did, just ask Kenny to come get it. Kenny is two weeks away from being unemployed. <laughs> All the checks you want. <laughs> well, that's something that's in my family I'm in business with. They think as long as they have checks, they have money. Not so. <laughs> and you have lots of opportunities for the upcoming year. There's lots of sign-ups in the fellowship hall, so be sure to peruse by and see where you can use your gifts in this big family. Especially if you look at those for January. Let's try to get those slots for Nosh and Hospitality and Diaconate Field for January. That'd be great. And Stacy Green, our vice moderator, is coordinating that for us this coming year. So I appreciate her making the sign-up sheet, so please try to do that. We still have some of these uh, Advent devotionals. They're wonderful. I tell you, uh, I did jump ahead a little bit yesterday and read today's and tomorrow's and Christmas Day. Woo! They're good. So even if you haven't had one yet, or you know someone that might like to read it, we have several still available there on the way out the door. Just grab one, and my advice would be to tell them, hey, just catch up with us. Start the day you give it to them. If it's Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or the day after, and just tell them to read at their own leisure. They're really good. But I'll tell you, these, these three coming up, are they had their Hager Passion one. <laughs> and, and they're an easy read too, they so you can, you can actually read through the whole devotional in a matter of uh, a day or even not even that, so uh, I think you'll enjoy those. You know, something that we really look forward to every year is the beautiful experience we have on Christmas Eve. We'll gather right here in this space. It'll look a lot like this. There'll be a few things different, but it'll be a beautiful, beautiful moment. We'll gather in candlelight and we'll want to sing and share and reflect and you know, one of the things that I've discovered many times in our Christmas Eve services is I fall in love with God again, mm -hmm. uh, and deeper in love. And so uh, it's a beautiful way to, uh, to, to be on Christmas Eve. So come and join us tomorrow night at 6 o'clock for our Christmas Eve service. Well, we've had our hashtag taking photos out there, and I have so enjoyed them. I've been taking them after worship. So we invite you, even if you've had your picture taken a few weeks ago, maybe you've changed a little bit since then, a few more pounds, a few more pounds I don't know, whatever. Or you haven't taken it with maybe someone here in the church family that you say, hey, come over here, let's take a picture together. Not only are they wonderful for us to post now with our hashtag or not, but they're also <laughs> wonderful for us to have just in, the, in our family pictures. And I, I imagine they'll find their way to our website sometime soon. And also, I'd like to invite you, as you're shopping after Christmas, to watch for blankets that are on sale. The month of January, our mission is going to be to work with a few other churches in the community, and we're going to 
overload the Catholic Action Center with some blankets. They're in deep need for folks who need a little more. It's a wonderful way, and I appreciate Pastor Pam for doing this and initiating this. As she had some churches in town call her. And it's a wonderful way for us to collaborate with other churches in town. The truth is, friends, that many of us across town and churches have different theologies and beliefs and ways of, of worshiping and etc. But surely we can all gather together to take care of the hungry, to take care of the cold, to take care of the homeless. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us to do that. And then, uh, right around the bend, you know, we have to be a little bit ahead of you all. We try to be. We have another beautiful series coming up called Drawn In, Living the Creative Life with God. And that will begin January the 13th. We hope you'll join us as we have that series, which will then lead us right into Lent. It's hard to believe. Hard to believe. Deep breaths. We thank you, God, for the breath you've given us and the song we can sing. Oh, we pray for all the young lives the shore by fear and shame. moment, all is calm, and all is bright. Verse of the hymn in 
invites us to lift our voices in hallelujahs to the one who is king. This scripture, scripture was more radical for the people of Jesus' time, as it resisted the powers of empire that threatened the least of these that Jesus came to serve. We are reminded by this seemingly benign and sweet song that wherever there is injustice in this world, we are to look to the one whose power is love. How might this increase our hope for the future? So let your hope shine in the sun.
is given to us, and the authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. <clears throat> and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judea, Judah, from, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. The Herod secretly called for the wise men and learn from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out. And there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen, rise, seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Well, I don't know about you, but it seems like we just had our Halloween party here at church, thrown quickly into Thanksgiving, and now Christmas Day is only a couple days away. And today brings our Advent Sundays to a close. It really is true what I've heard my parents and grandparents say over the years, that it seems the older you get, the more quickly time passes. Before beginning today's reflection, I want to thank you all. I want to thank you for your faithfulness and attendance and participation these past several Sundays, and especially since we began our Advent Sunday on December 2nd. You've given Kenny, Pam, and I some feedback about our services, and I think it's important for you to know that we value and appreciate what you have to say to us and your suggestions and your feedback with us. For many, we have heard that this Advent series, Common Bright, has been meaningful to you. And I also want to thank so many who worked very hard for months in advance to plan our visuals and for the amazing folks I share ministry with. Pam, Kenny, and Brenda, our elders, our council, and our trustees. I am grateful for all of them. And I'm grateful, so grateful for all of you. And I wanted to take this opportunity to tell you just that. Having begun studying and preparing sermons for our Advent series way back in September, I knew months ago that this Sunday sermon reflection, I knew what it would be about and I knew what it would be titled. Once I've read commentaries and broken down scripture into its original languages and put the words in the context of history and time and audience and genre, only then am I, am I beginning to write. <coughs> Interesting enough, sermons always come to my head first before a key is pressed on the keyboard. Well, in truth, I hope, and this is the Sunday we are focusing on hope, I hope that sermons come to my heart first make their way to my head, and then finally to some notes on a page. A few weeks ago, when it was really time to hunker down and narrow things in, 
I was ready. I had studied. I had prayed. I had an outline. I had things that felt to me as if God were prodding me to, to share them. And I had a title. And yet, in the busyness of the season, I had not taken all that through to manuscript until Friday night. And in hindsight, I think that was indeed more about God's timing than mine. Keeping hope real. I had the title. I had in my mind talking about the different types of hope. I had some thoughts. But until very early Thursday morning, I didn't have another real experience with real hope. Many of you who are regulars know that I've mentioned several times this year how difficult 2018 has been for me, for my wife Brenda, for my mom, an extended family. We've endured more deaths and unexpected deaths this year than in my 56 years thus far. <coughs> so I would also thank you this morning from my heart for your love and your patience and your support as I have continued to work through this. It was from these losses, friends, that my title and thoughts back in September landed on keeping hope real. For you see, I use the word hope a lot, as most of us do. And sometimes, perhaps, the frequency of the word results in a loss of real meaning. I hope that the mall is not crowded on Christmas Eve. <laughs> <You're> all right. <laughs> I hope that my team wins the game, and they did last night, but it's always 50-50. I hope that I do well in a job interview and I'm hired. Well, that depends on what type of employees they hope for and how many others have applied and are hoping for the same thing. It's not that these more flippant uses of the word hope are bad. Indeed, they are part of our daily lives. And yet, especially this year, I had heard from those of you in our church family, I hope I can find a life partner. I hope that I can find a job, any job. I hope that I can find a place to live that I can afford. I hope that my insurance approves the medication I so desperately need. And this year, especially this year, I have experienced, and I know some of you have as well, I hope that the relationship can be reconciled. I hope that the challenges and troubles of our church family can have some resolve and and sometimes, I hope that some will decide to come back to church. I hope the cancer goes into remission again. I hope that person I love so dearly beats the addiction. I hope the cancer goes into remission for the first time. I hope that the grief will become more bearable. Uh, to be sure, I've hoped many of these things, and yet at times my hopes seem not to have mattered because some relationships are still strained. Some challenges and troubles of our church family still aren't resolved in many cases, and, and some have decided not to come back to Bluegrass to find their church home in another place. This year, cancer didn't go into remission again. Cancer didn't go into remission at all. And grief still lingers. Yet for sure I have been on the other side of hope that seems to flow right out of my heart in prayers, only to not see much, if any, promise. Only on some cases to feel hopeless and helpless. How about you, friends? How about you? For that is the human condition, really, isn't it? That is the world condition. And this morning, scripture passages just nail that down for us. From Isaiah that Daniel read, we hear this hope of a child given to us whose authority will be upon his shoulders. In other words, who will teach us a new way to live and to love. And he will be named Wonderful, 
Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Parent, Prince of Peace. Such wonder, such promise, such mystery, such hope. Now remember, friends, the first hearers of these words would be those in the Hebrew community who had been repeatedly oppressed, killed, pushed to the margins, ridiculed, and persecuted. And as one of my favorite singers, Ann Murray, sings in one of her famous songs, we sure could use a little good news today. And in that time... In that ancient community, this promise, this hope from Isaiah's prophecy was good news. And yet, as we turn to Matthew's gospel, good news meets reality. Now then, even though we all include the magi or wise men in living nativity scenes and those on our mantles and tables, Although children are still playing the part of wise men, which I hope include girls now. <laughs> the truth is that the Magi came way after the birth of Jesus. And if you paid close attention to what Pam read, it says when they entered the house. And so that tells us Jesus was not in the barn. The details, the small details. So they didn't even start seeking to find this wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting parent, prince of peace, until after word had reached King Herod. And they didn't have Facebook then. <laughs> or any other modern method of communication. It was word of mouth, and the mouths were separated by significant geographical ranges, as well as very good differences in social class and economics and education and jobs. Whenever the word did reach Herod, we're familiar with the story that Pam read. Herod pretends to be interested in finding this baby boy in other, uh, order to pay homage or honor to him. When in fact, what we know is he really wants Jesus to be destroyed. And so as the story goes, the Magi follow the star, find the infant in the house, are moved to bow down to him and worship and then go back home. By another way. Another key detail. Telling us that they were intentionally avoiding Herod in order to do their part in ensuring that God's newest messenger would not be silenced and would be allowed to live and grow and learn and teach. Upon discovering that he had been had by those he sent, Herod becomes upset and enraged and orders all male children under the age of two to be murdered. I might have only imagined then how quickly good news turned into tragedy. Much like refugees today, the lucky ones, who find their way into our country, and they have been physicians in their native land, and now they're driving Ubers to make ends meet. Because the Herods of our contemporary world break into lives and destroy them. Literally. As well as economically. And in family and social and religious circles. Think of all the lives that continue to be destroyed by human made boundaries. Lord have mercy. It is within this tension that we arrive today to reflect upon hope. Hope for the ancient community quickly vanished into their worst nightmare. Imagine you had a, well, a little boy, two or under. Imagine how their hope vanished. And I felt that kind of hope vanish. I wonder if you have. I wonder if you've hoped for something and and then had someone or something quickly take that hope away. By a decision made, or a medication ineffective, or an unwilling relationship or a friendship partner, my guess is that we have all been there and done that more than once. And yet, and yet, my brothers and sisters, people of faith, 
keep telling this story of a child born over 2,000 years ago whose authority will be upon his shoulders, who will teach us a new way to live and love and endure, and yes, hope. And he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Parent, Prince of Peace. You see, I think we keep telling this story because sometimes it's all we have left is hope. We keep telling this story, I believe, friends, because we've been in the ditches of despair and grief or heartache and someone has come to us just in time with a gesture of love and support in disguise of a casserole or a text or a phone call. Or a trip to the mailbox. Where someone shared an experience with us which make us believe that we can and we will make it to the other side somehow. And I think we keep telling this story because sometimes we do find ourselves on the side of hope that makes us the encouragers or the reconciled or the balm for the wounded souls and heavy hearts. Well, that brings me back to Thursday morning. We were the first ones to arrive at the doctor's office for some tests. Tests which give everyone in the room a lot of anxiety, patient and those who accompany him or her. And the longer you're there, the more the anxiety takes the higher ground until you are just reeling. That was me this past Thursday, accompanying someone that I love very, very, very dearly. And it was a five-hour doctor's encounter. And after four hours, even having texts with my loved one to get periodic updates, I asked the front desk, can I go back and join them? Because by this time, I was convinced the news was not going to be good. My mind had raced, and I had reached out to others in my life for support via text and, and asking for prayer so that I could be strong when the bad news was finally delivered. I cannot take much of this. I said to myself, surely not something more before this very difficult year ends. The front desk, friendly and caring, explained to me that only patients can go back until and unless there was a doctor consultation. My stomach sank when I heard those words. Only patients can go back until and unless there is a doctor consultation. And with that, I was hoping that I would never join my loved one behind that closed door. Less than 15 minutes after I had inquired about going back and was told the rules, another man who had been waiting about an hour less than me was called. Mike, could you come join your wife? I didn't know Mike, although we had spent over three hours in the waiting room together, legs moving, feet padding, hands sweating hours. But what I knew, friends, was that Mike and his wife were about to get some bad news. I didn't know the extent of the bad news, and I didn't need to know. Because what I knew was that Mike had been called to a place that I no longer wanted to go. And about 20 minutes later, as I was now very grateful to still be in the waiting room, Mike and his wife left. And as they walked through that door to a hallway leading to an elevator to begin a very new journey in their lives, I prayed for them. Literally, I bowed my head in prayer and I said, God, be with them. Give them the strength to endure what lies ahead. Give them comfort for the tough days. Give them peace with an uncertain future. And God, please give them hope. 
always hope, real hope, no matter what happens. <clears throat> you see, my brothers and sisters, on Thursday, I was on the other side of the door and stayed there. And so I was on the other side of hope, the other side of where I've been previous times this year. For in those five hours, I hoped that the tests would be negative, and this time they were. And yet I've come far enough in my life to know that sometimes things don't work out as we hope. And that, friends, is when hope gets real. Because thanks be to God, our hope doesn't start and stop with whether or not we get a job or insurance pays or we find a partner or we reconcile with a friend or get good news at the doctor's office or the medicine works. Hope is real because we hold tight to this story even in the face of Herod's in person or in circumstance. We hold tight to this story of a child born over 2,000 years ago whose authority will be upon his shoulders who will teach us a new way to live and to love and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Parent, Prince of Peace and Messenger of Hope. God will be all of that and more in our life. And a little child shall lead. And a little child did lead them. And perhaps can even still lead us <clears throat> to peace, to love, to joy. And thank God can lead us to hope. May it be so. May it be so. Sanctuary is a station for 
And we also have beside that station a bottle of sanitizer, recognizing that this is the season for a lot of colds and coughs. So we care for each other and our family if we just put a little of that hand sanitizer on our hands before we break the bread. And then we invite you, perhaps after you've lit a candle or put a star on the tree or given your offering, or somewhere before all that, or even just that, take a piece of bread and then take a cup and return to your seats for a time of meditation. Let us take a moment of silence, of calm, in order to center our hearts and let go of those things in our lives that we regret, maybe letting go of those things that we hope for and are, are unsure about. We will lift them to God asking for the hope that we find. May it be so. Friends, know this. Already your world is a little bit calmer and brighter. Having offered to God the bits of chaos clouding your life are those things that you yearn for so deeply. And now the dark skies can give away to beams of light illuminating your way. Move forward into God's future, forgiven and free and full of real hope. Let the people say, Amen. Come for the way has been lived before you. Come and take in and take on the hope of Christ that is being reborn in us again today. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and our praise. God, in the beginning, you called out, let there be light. Just as your light of creation spread in response, so too does your light rise this new day. Offering us all a new chance to make today just a little brighter than yesterday. So when we feel overcome or succumb to the dark night of our souls, God, you offer us a way back into the light of hope. And so we praise you, sing. tender and mild was a sign of new life, a sign of holy vulnerability, a sign of your presence enfleshed in our human form. This would be the light that showed forth the truth that all humanity is beloved and called us to care for each other as beloved. Jesus gathered people around the tables and showed them their radiance. And then he said to them that this bread and this cup are my life and they are for you. And just as my light shines in you, let your light shine for the world. Let us pray. Pour out your spirit on us and on these gifts, O God. Transform us into the light of your love for all, into your hope for all. And God, make us one in you. Thanks and praise be to our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer. Amen. Christ be our light, shine in our hearts, shine through the darkness. Christ be our light, shine in your church, gather to.
offering our tithes, hanging our stars. As we do all of this, we join God in a time of communion with bread and cup. Come, friends, as you are comfortable and participate, come and be fed. Mm -hmm.
stars together proclaim the holy birth and praises sing and voices ring with peace to all on earth how silent we how silent we the wondrous gift is given so God in part to human hearts the glorious love of hell no one discerns God's coming but in this world of sin where yearning souls long to be the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. special song for them. 
<laughs> so, uh, the homily, I've already timed it, it's eight minutes, so you don't have to listen to me long tomorrow. We're going to sing a lot of carols, and we're going to end the service with singing the, our theme song for this series, which has been, We Need a Silent Night in Here. But tomorrow night, we will be joining over 300 churches across the country and singing that song, leading us into silent nights. We hope you'll join us tomorrow at 6. So friends, as we leave, go with God on your way, and let the Spirit guide your way. Offer hope to all you greet, and like Christ, see God in all you need. May it be so. We need a silent night in here. We need your presence to be near. Give us the hope we need and the peace we see. We need a silent night in here. Give us the hope we need. Silent night, we need a silent night.